a less known aspect of COVID was its impact on the history of civil aviation in Kashmir. Once limited airline operations resumed during the pandemic, an Indian carrier, Go Air, commenced international flights between Srinagar and Sharjah in the UAE. The national carrier Air India had in previous years flown Hajj charters between the Kashmiri capital and Jeddah. Its subsidiary Air India Express flew briefly to neighboring Dubai. Just what was so special about Go Air? It was owned and operated by Jinnah's great grandsons of the Bombay Wadia family who never opted for his Muslim Zion. I point this out because Go Air is in administration since May 2023, but this flight was discontinued earlier when Pakistan refused it over flying rights. Right through the pandemic note, Pakistan did not object to these flights. But when Mr. Shah, the Indian Home Minister, visited Srinagar and what's more inaugurated, formally speaking, this service as a scheduled service in October 2021, after the world lived back to normalcy, Pakistan's Foreign Office slapped this ban on the carrier arms airs using its airspace. All those months, previous months, when COVID regulated bubble flights bilaterally agreed between India and various countries, including the UAE for this service, elicited not a squeak from Pakistan. If Kashmir indeed is an open-air prison as the co-editors of the recently published Rutledge Handbook of Critical Kashmir Studies maintain, then its leftist activists and anthropologists committed to a so-called liberatory approach might have undertaken fieldwork imperative in their field by querying Kashmiris departing or arriving in Sharjah as to how were they able to procure passports to exit Kashmir, supposedly cut off from the rest of the world, an Indian Xinjiang since 2019, as some Salo intellectuals would have us believe. Uyghurs domiciled in Kashmir since the 1950s don't feel incarcerated. Uyghur women folk are not separated from husbands by the Indian equivalent of the People's Security Bureau deployed across Xinjiang, with concubinage reports by human rights activists with Han security personnel taking conjugal liberties with these Muslim women. Nor are Kashmiri children bundled off to indoctrination camps run by Hindu chauvinists of the BJP or its spin offs. To point all this out is no gratuitous vote battery nor is it to deflect overdue attention and justified aspersions against successive, flat-footed Indian administrations whose malfeasance has brought Kashmir to this impasse. The liberal Indian establishment too, academia and the commentariat, have been just as disgracefully complicit in shying away from offering nuanced, critical rethinking of the Kashmir question in the Indian Federation, and in so doing here today, I can but devote my limited time to only certain select features as a historian. Number one, both Vallabhai Patel and N. A. Jinnah, Deputy Indian Prime Minister and Governor General respectively agreed Kashmir could be independent so long as it did not join either dominion. Patel subsequently changed his mind, as did Jinnah when he claimed its succession was predicated on, quote, fraud and violence. Two, Jinnah had certainly come some way in his thinking on Kashmir. A man renowned for his principled intransigence, he displayed no interest in that princely realm during his three visits, 1926, 1936, and 1944. By the time of his last visit, he was popular among certain sections of the Muslim population, and there was doubtless groundswell for the Pakistan movement as across the rest of British India. Pakistani historian Farooq Ahmad Dar, an ethnic Kashmiri himself, highlights that Jinnah was reticent to cultivate the Muslim Conference Party, lest its closest to the All India Muslim League raise suspicion among other quarters of the kingdom. Three, not, notwithstanding the current Hindu rights urge to denigrate Nehru, the question of plebiscite, burst to a ceasefire of the ongoing jihadist war initiated by Pakistani irregulars, in connivance with its army since October 1947 was never his idea. It was Mountbatten's brainchild, who as Governor General mooted it to the Indian cabinet, and it was neither discussed nor objected to by Nehru, his deputy Patel or others. I have argued elsewhere that Jinnah was in the know of the jihadist raiders, just as Nawaz Sharif was 52 years later in May 99 in Kargil. And Jinnah for the record, rejected a plebiscite in Kashmir when Mountbatten flew to Lahore 1st November 1947 to meet him and his deputy Liaquat Ali Khan.
Pakistanis would do well to realize that their founder had no such interest in any plebiscite at all. The 1947-48 war established the mainstay of Pakistani civilian-military relations, which was to play itself out subsequently. Had Liaquat Ali Khan not been assassinated, he would have been ousted by Pakistan's first successful coup as Prime Minister in 1951, not 1958, when, with Major Akbar Khan, organizer of the Pashtun Jihadist raiders, assuming the office of state. Nawaz Sharif came to Bill Clinton in July 1999, seeking an honorable exit from Kargil and to save his skin from the military. They struck back three months later in October 1999. And they're still in business, the Pakistani military that is, imprisoning prime ministers when not exiling or executing them. India's de jure position on the accession of the princely state was upheld by the UN. Not for nothing did Pakistan never mention the plebiscite in UN Security Council Resolution 211 following the Second Indo-Pak War of 1965 and Resolution 311 after the Third Indo-Pak War of 1971 or the following year's similar agreement. Five. It is the legal principle of rebus sic standibus in international law, ladies and gentlemen, which clinches the Indian case. Because international law maintains and provides for one party to be exonerated from a prior undertaking or obligation if there is a vital change in circumstances existing at the time the obligation was undertaken. Material circumstances have altered considerably since 1947, which prevents India from exercising commitment it held out in the first instance. Pakistan forced India to renege, holding just such a plebiscite. And it goes naturally to explain Nehru's address to the Indian Parliament some months before his death, 27th November 1963, when he clarified, quote, Article 370 is part of certain transitional provisional arrangements. It is not a permanent part of the Constitution. It is a part so long as it remains so close, quote. Number six, as I wind down now to my conclusion. Two summations. Ladakh's autonomy as a distinct political unity harks to agitations in the 1950s by its Buddhist and Shia populations who sought separation from the former kingdom, which was something achieved in August 2019, administratively speaking. India, however, I contend, failed in effectively articulating the repealing of Articles 370 and 35A by citing how statehood had been swiftly devolved on Arunachal Pradesh in February 1987, following the Sundarang Chu standoff on the disputed Sino-Indian frontier in late 1986. An erratic Trump threatening to pull out of Afghanistan carried out by his just as lackluster successor, assuredly set alarm bells ringing in New Delhi to absorb Jammu and Kashmir into the Indian Union once and for all. Arunachal Pradesh, like Jammu and Kashmir, is a peripheral outlier whose accession and sovereignty remains contested. I believe I may be the well for the first historian to highlight this precedent, which has not been discussed so far in scholarship of Kashmir studies. Seven, and finally, Democracies, ladies and gentlemen, do not start wars. India did not in 1947 or later. It is fitting to conclude noting how New Delhi successfully brought the African Union into the G21. Unlike Beijing or Moscow, the Indian Republic, during the last 76 years on, sent peacekeepers and financial or economic assistance to the continent. Sino-Soviet machinations abetted proxy wars of liberation then, or the Wagner Group and Belt and Road predatory forays now. Social dislocation, mayhem, and instability are China and Russia's legacy to Africa. Africa's eastern littoral is the Western Indian Ocean, whose security and stability holds ramifications for our Indo Pacific tilt here in Great Britain and this parliamentary group's remit. But that is the kernel of another Westminster discussion. Thank you. <laughs>